So I want to welcome everybody uh, to today's um, webinar on market research. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kelly Ray, and I'm on the Mid-Columbia Chapter PRSA Program Committee. So, um, I'm excited to um, introduce our speakers today, um, Sunny and Aaron with Sonar Insights, based in Kennewick, Washington. Aaron is CEO of Sonar Insights and has 20 years of business operations and global strategy consulting experience, building new product pipelines and creating organizational momentum. Sunny is Chief Operating Officer at Sonar with over 15 years of experience developing corporate market strategies, new brand and product innovations and go-to market executions. Um, these guys love digging into data uh, to help solve a problem or come up with creative solutions. Um, I've learned a lot from them personally and I'm excited to have them here today uh, to share why a little market research can go a long way with your audiences, communication strategies and with your company's brand. So with that, over to you, Sunny. All right. So today, um, during our presentation, we'll be discussing the benefits of getting customer data, consumer data, uh, including when and how to do it uh, in terms of market research uh, to understand your audience. I'll show you a few case studies about organizations that we use research to help you know, create messaging that resonates with new demographics and continues to elevate the brand loyalty of the current brand. <laughs> um, so today, the items I will be covering are uh, six myths of research about why organizations don't do market research uh, to truly understand and know their audience, and we're going to be setting the record straight for that as well. Um, secondly, uh, we are going to cover the real value of market research and how little can go a long way and provide relevant case studies of the work that we've done uh, for some clients to help fast track their strategies and their communications. And lastly, um, how we can help, how, how, how research can help solve problems and bring opportunities for your organization, but as, also as uh, yourself as individuals. So why some organizations avoid research? So they avoid research in multitudes of ways, but here's are the main big ones that we've come across. Uh, when we have been speaking with clients um, as well as individuals and organizations. Some of these are fallacies that we like to point out and the ones that we hear all the time. <laughs> Typically, you know, organizations, they know that market research is valuable, but sometimes one wants to take the easy way out. Uh, first and mostly, um, they say, all we have to do is nothing. <laughs> because we already know our customer. Um, it seems like we're doing great with what we're doing now. Why should we need to know anymore? I mean, our customers are satisfied, our consumers are satisfied. Um, we don't need to do any more market research or any at all. Um, secondly, um, is all we have to do is do what we did before. Um, I think everybody kind of speaks to this as well. So why do we need to do anything different? It's not broken, why fix it? Why disrupt a good thing? Um, so we hear that quite a bit. And lastly, and, uh, is that all we have to do is let's just copy the competition. <laughs> Why should we do the late work since they've already done it? Um, let's just copy their strategies, understand what they did, and just do the same thing. Um, these, seems, these seem like reasonable strategies uh, when it comes to not saying, hey, let's, let's not pay attention to do market research. Let's just keep doing things that we're doing. But typically, when you don't do market research, um, it doesn't help gain and retain new consumers um, often. It stunts uh, brand expansion uh, because it's not relevant. And then the company's growth kind of stays stagnant or the same. Um, it may be even declined if nothing is done when it comes to market research. Um, so a little goes a long way. The one thing that to point out is that these fallacies can be fixed, uh, but let's but let's set the record straight uh, for these fallacies. And the one thing that sets it straight is that change is constant. Um, in our world, Aaron and I uh, view change as an opportunity to do something different, um, change what the brand looks like, messages and things that make things more relevant and 
uh, pertinent to today. I mean, change is all around us. Um, consumer preferences and needs are always changing and their perceptions and attitudes as well. Um, it could be due to lifestyle changes, uh, life stage changes, physical, mental, emotional uh, changes. Um, I mean, change is on, always going to be on the horizon and the impact on, on when and where you uh, want to connect with your audience, you have to understand those changes as well. Uh, secondly, the environment, the environment that they live in um, is very important because that's always changing. Um, and Ryan, and we say, when we say the environment is the external influences uh, that impact them your audience and it's a huge influence on a consumer and how they interact with messages organizations brands products you know, services and offerings across the board um, the environment you know dictates how they buy products um, how they consume data and knowledge um, from you um, but also how um, other influencers uh, by customers like such as lead users can influence your 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 audience as well. I mean, technology is a big one. Social media is a big one uh, in terms of how it influences your audience. So um, understanding the external perspective um, and those changes is very important. And lastly, competition. Uh, competition is always changing, uh, whether it's direct competition, indirect competition, whether it's new or old, um, it's going to have an impact on your audience because they're always evolving and changing and looking to grab that market share, um, whether it's, you know, dollars or ears or hearts, um, competition is always going to um, be evolving. So um, new ways to build and perceive loyalty, trust, and new experience of delighters is going to be key uh, moving forward. So I would say, you know, change can be a bit scary, but, you know, we have to navigate through that, whether it's big or small, especially for us as um, you know, market researchers, we have to understand that help our, our clients uh, navigate that world. Uh, but also, you know, just to kind of say it's scary, but it's a good segue to opportunity to do things differently and better. Um, so view change as a very opportunistic um, thing as well. When you're thinking like, oh, you know, I shouldn't be doing anything or the competition, I can copy. Uh, those are kind of things that, that change can combat against. Any questions thus far? I'm not. I'm not seeing any in the chat box so far. Okay, perfect. So uh, three other um, assumptions um, uh, that we've run across is that uh, that it's not worth doing because it costs too much, uh, it takes too much time, and it's too hard. Um, we always say, you know, the cost is minimal when you imagine the cost if you don't do the market research instead. Uh, many, many times, uh, you know, you can throw money at a message that falls on deaf ears. And I'm pretty sure it might have happened to a few folks. Um, it happened to a few folks on our end. Uh, but, you know, wasting your marketing dollars is tough. You know, now imagine if you're it's a time to do a marketing campaign and that falls flat. Um, you wasted all that time when a little research could have, at the front end could have saved time on the back end and in the long run uh, because it gives you direction and some focus and you know you're barking up the right tree. Um, and if you think it's too hard, uh, typically anything is worthwhile when it's hard, right? Um, but when you do the hard things, you get the benefits from them. Um, it always gets... It always gets to help doing market research with experts that can help you, you know, through it as well. So you're not on, in it on your own. Uh, there's people that can help, uh, organizations that are out there that can provide the data to you. Um, so if it's too hard, you can go find a partner, <laughs> find a new best friend. I love that. So setting the market straight for, you know, it's cost too much. Uh, it's too uh, hard to do, things like that. There's, you know, asking those assumptions that any data is better than no data. Um, research can come in, you know, in many forms. It can be free. You can pay for it. Um, you can look at historical data uh, to help make decisions or draft messages. Um, you can use real-time data to build those uh, with your audience. Uh, you can get qualitative or quantitative data to back up uh, any strategy, decision-making, or, 
more uh, campaigns that you develop. So research can be completely free um, through observations. Uh, it can be crowdsourced or simply asking one question to 10 people. That's any source of data that's free right there. Or you can pay you know, small amounts for our data, whether it's you know, going, getting reports from a data house or conducting your own study, uh, whether it's a survey or some interviews to understand consumer needs and learning more about your audience. Um, research comes in all types of form and depends on the answers that you, and the data you want or what you need to learn about your audience. It can be, it can be what happened in the past um, historically and how can we learn from them or it can look at it in real time and understand the future trends. Uh, historical data can come from sales data, communication data that you've had in the past or you've seen in the organization that you've used before, past reports. Uh, Real-time data can be collected through surveys. Uh, we can get answers through um, uh, conducting your own survey uh, research, uh, conducting focus groups and sessions to test messages or concepts uh, to understand the whys behind their answers and what really resonates with your audience or even having workshops um, in real time and building marketing strategies with your audience in a room, understanding what they want uh, at that moment, um, understanding you know what channels do they want to receive messages? What are the visual cues that they want to see? Uh, even down to colors and palettes and um, just key words uh, could be helpful um, in that session. Um, and then when it comes to qualitative versus quantitative, Word and dialogue, dialogue versus numbers or stats are equal in research. Either you want to know the whys and the reasons behind your audience's attitudes and behaviors to accept your message or your brand, or understanding the magnitude of how well your message was received, seen, or heard, and how they're revisiting it um, by your audience is a proven indicator if it's successful or it's failing or you need to tweak or change things. So. Um, market research is very key on that. So, so again, any data is better than no data. Um, that's kind of the key message that we want to set the record straight when it comes to uh, understanding your audience through market research. So now I'd like to move over to Aaron. Thanks, Sonny. So, hi, everybody. I'm Aaron Welling, and I wanted to cover a couple of things uh, based on all the stuff that uh, Sonny's given to you thus far. So, now that uh, we've talked about some of the myths around market research, uh, we want to talk about why you should do market research and the value that's going to come from that. Um, the first thing, the main reason that you want to do market research is to get data pure and simple. All that data can help you solve challenges in your job. Uh, we like to say the data speaks for itself. Anyone can give their opinions, and we know that everybody gives their opinions maybe too frequently, but data doesn't lie. Um, so what kind of data can market research get you? Well, first and foremost, you've got your customer-centric data and feedback. Can't stress this one enough. Any type of research will get you customer feedback. And that feedback is invaluable, whether it's quotes from a focus group or an interview or just the sheer number of what hundreds of people say in a survey, data is the fuel to understand what to put in front of your audience. Uh, the second thing is changing needs. Um, we don't live in bubbles and things change based on how the world is changing. Uh, COVID, I think, was a good example of how quickly things can change for customers. Uh, if you aren't using research to identify the changes happening with your audience, you'll miss out on potential opportunities and maybe consistently on your back foot as you struggle to adjust reactively. Uh, the third thing that you want to get data about is competitive insight. It's hard to compete if you don't know what customers think of your competitors. Market research can help you understand where your competition is succeeding and where they're failing. And it can give you insights on how to take advantage of those successes and failures and bridge those gaps into something that's really impactful. Um, another thing that we wanna talk about when it comes to research is you should do research early and often. Market research shouldn't be a one-time endeavor. Um, it should be used 
frequently in your work and in your projects. Our, our experience shows that the most successful organizations are constantly gathering data. So when to do that? Well, you can use research at the beginning of a campaign to learn more about your audience before you move down a road too far. This ensures you identify your target or identify and define their needs or preferences. It can help you craft a message, make sure that it's going to work before you put it out in front of hundreds of thousands of people or before you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in getting that message out. Um, you can conduct market research during your communications or marketing campaigns to identify ways to tweak it and refine it so that you can continue to hone and perfect that message and its delivery in the market. And finally, you can use market research to measure the impact that you made after your campaign, giving you opportunity to show the value to others in your organization and so you can set yourself up for the next project. All right. So talked a lot about some uh, thoughts and ideas and theories and concepts, but I know that what people really want to understand is, well, how's this work somewhere else? Um, what have you done to show that this has actually worked in a real world experience? So we want to share a couple of case studies with you from research that we've engaged in in the last over the last 12 months. <clears throat> the first case, um, oh, and before I jump in here, if you have questions on any of this, please just jump in, put it as something in the chat. We're happy to get interrupted and get some questions while we're doing this. Um, but the first case we wanna talk about is uh, with an organization called Mid-Columbia Libraries. Now, Mid-Columbia Libraries operates in Benton and Franklin counties here in Washington state, and it serves a very diverse population. It's got about 15 different branches and uh, it was both in urban and rural areas. As part of their strategic planning process, Mid-Columbia Libraries wanted to know what the needs of their community were and how they were changing. They were especially interested in identifying the needs of historically marginalized and underserved communities. So in order to do this research, we wanted to make sure we did uh, two types of research, both qualitative and quantitative. Our first job was to identify the biggest needs in the community. Now we could have put the Mid-Columbia Library staff and leadership in a room and made them come up with a list of all the needs, but that would have been an incomplete list. Instead, we sought out community members to get their ideas. We, to do this qualitative research at the front end, we conducted six focus groups, three in English and three in Spanish and facilitated three town halls with community organizations. We did all of these in person uh, with half in rural communities and the other half in urban locations. And we included, uh, we included individuals from marginalized communities also. All these insights from these focus groups gave us an expanded list of needs that we used for the next phase of the study. And I have to stress that there were a lot of things that came up that we never would have come up with on our own and that the library wouldn't have come up on, with on their own. Those focus groups and uh, town halls were invaluable in getting the right insights to do the next phase of our work. So following those focus groups, we wanted to quantify how big those needs were and who they affected most. The best way to do this was to, to do surveys. So we collected more than 2,500 surveys in order to identify and quantify those needs. And by collecting demographic information along with the reaction to the biggest needs, we were able to cross tabulate the data according to gender, ethnicity, language, age, household income, education, and location. This gave rich data for Mid-Columbia Libraries to create a strategy for both urban and rural for their historically marginalized populations, as well as age and income related populations and communities. So the result of the study was a robust three to five year strategy that is grounded in data across the community, as well as representative of different populations within that community. Mid-Columbia Libraries is already implementing the strategy across their entire system of libraries, and the individual libraries are using the data specific to their regions and their communities to better engage with their individual populations. Any questions about that case study before I jump over to the next one? 
Um, not specifically on the case study, but Jessica had a question about something you were talking about earlier about competitor feedback. Okay. Great. And she says, how do you interact with their customers? Great question. So in order to interact with other uh, customers, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. You can do that through focus groups and you can do that through surveys. Um, focus groups helps to get a lot more qualitative data from those users. So um, it often starts with a quick survey to screen and to find people that are uh, that are using your competitor and then bringing them into a uh, into a focus group setting where you can start to pick their brains a little bit and understand why they choose a competitor over the company that you're representing and then um, start to understand the why behind it so that you can adjust your business and your strategy according to what is working uh, for the competitor. Or you can find out what the competitor isn't doing and the gaps that they have so that you can uh, better fill those gaps and woo more customers over. And Sunny, we just had a couple other questions come in. When you were talking about the survey for the library project, mm -hmm. Debbie's asking, how do you find or target the people who you survey? And is the survey sent through email? And if so, how do you get people's emails? Okay. Now, so first of all, how do you find or target the people? Yeah, this is a this is a really good question. Uh, there is not one way to target the people to get the survey. So we have a database of uh, people that we can uh, communicate with here in the uh, Tri Cities region. The other thing that we have is we have a national partner that has uh, lists of databases that we can tap into to uh, continue to get more surveys that way. The other thing that we do, we uh, utilize Facebook and social media, and we put out ads and um, posts so that we can encourage people to click on a link, take a survey. Um, for that uh, Mid-Columbia Libraries survey, we um, let people know that there was going to be a drawing for an iPad at the end of the survey, so that helped to give people a little bit more incentive on uh, filling out that survey. Um, and then there's a uh, we also did just a lot of uh, on the boots or on the, excuse me, uh, on the ground, boots on the ground uh, research. We went to uh, different locations and found people in parking lots and asked them to fill out a survey. Um, we had some people that were, um, we got a lot of them done that way. We uh, had the library hand them out to people at the library, also encouraging them to uh, get those surveys. So it was a group effort from uh, from us and from the client in getting those 2,500 surveys that we needed. Yep, um, and we, uh, we also distributed um, paper surveys and uh, the survey link uh, via email um, to partners as well um, in, in the community. Um, so like the Hispanic uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, um, downtown Pasco. Um, I hope everybody's familiar with the uh, the Mid Columbia region. Um, so across the entire Tri Cities, uh, to all these qualified partners to help spread the word, but also the the survey physically and electronically as well. Yeah. So that answers one of the questions about how you get people's emails um, using part partners who have mailing lists of people who have given permission um, mm -hmm. is right. is one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So we, we leverage our partners, but we also have our uh, database as well that we leverage. Your, so your, own, yep. your own mailing list, right. Um, another question from Mike, <laughs> whom you know and you've worked with. Um, when you were talking about the town halls for the library project, Mike would like to know, would you describe how you organized and facilitated those town halls? That's funny because Mike was at one of those town halls, but I'm going to answer the question <laughs> he anyway. He wants other people to know. know. <laughs> so uh, those town halls were facilitated. We, again, worked with our partners. We worked with the library. They identified some people that they felt like were community leaders and wanted they wanted to have at those town halls. Um, we also ident um, identified some people that we thought were leaders in the community. We targeted them individually. We invited them to come to the session. Uh, at the library and, uh, you know, individual invites and emails got 
got lots of people to come to those uh, to got got them to come to those town halls. Now, once we were there, uh, facilitating uh, is uh, is a lot of fun in my opinion. But uh, it's just it's just a matter of asking uh, a couple of questions, encouraging participation, um, asking the why behind the the um, the answers that they give us, so that we can understand the the deeper. Um, you know, the, the, the deeper purpose behind what they say and just encouraging uh, that discussion. Uh, we always mention within any focus group, uh, no idea is a bad idea. Everybody's opinion is a good one. We want to make sure we, we hear that. And so it's just a matter of uh, a lot of listening, a lot of um, taking notes and making sure you've got the right questions to, to, to get the most out of those sessions. Yeah. In addition to internal in terms of facilitation and gathering insights, uh, you know, majority of the time you'll get 80 for the 20 in terms of the commonalities um, of insights. And like how it says, no idea is a good idea or a bad idea, they're just ideas. But the ones that are completely different or even disruptive are the ones that can lead to opportunities um, to communicate differently, to target an audience in a new way uh, and things like that. So it's important to have that type of dialogue um, in order to create breakthrough um, campaigns, communications, new products and things like that. So um, it's a very valuable exercise um, for the library itself. Um, they saw a lot of things that would never have come to light if we didn't have those conversations. So yeah, thank you for that question, Mike. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. I really like your point about asking the why behind people's answers. I, I'm sure that gives you a lot more insight into what they're really asking or what they really care about. Yes. Um, so a question came up that we knew would co come up because when we were talking with you guys yesterday, uh, Kelly and I, we, we mentioned this, or I think you mentioned it. So Kathy is asking roughly how much would you charge for all of this research with the library project? That is a great question. We don't disclose the amount that, uh, people paid for that type of uh, a project. Um, what we do make sure we do with any project though, is we tailor it to the specific needs. And so there is no, you know, one size fits all. There's always, you know, just one price. So it really just depends on how difficult the people are to find uh, the research, how many surveys that we need to get, how many focus groups we need to do, um, doing them in Spanish uh, as well as English adds a little bit of cost, but it's not an astronomical uh, amount. And uh, it's one of the things that we often hear like uh, is, oh, just the, the research must be really, really expensive. It's not. It's not as expensive as you think it's going to be. And the insights that you get from it is worth it in the long run. So sorry to be really vague on that. No, that's that's um, good information. And just so everybody knows, we will be, I think Kelly mentioned this, but the um, the presentation and the video link will be sent out to everyone a few days after this. So you'll have contact information for Aaron and Sunny, and um, they will be more than happy to give you a cost estimate um, a, about a particular project that you might have in mind or, you know, work with you on your budget. And um, <laughs> okay, Debbie has a follow up to that. She says, I understand. Can you share the lowest budget number for you to take on a new client? We have done initial projects that have been $2,000 for a simple survey. You're trying to get a little bit of data. Um, and, you know, we, we put together the survey, we put it out there, we get the responses, we would deliver you a report. Uh, it's not a lot of money, um, depending on how extensive it is and how big it is and how hard it is to, to find the target that you're looking at. It, all of that changes, but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where it starts. Okay, that's, that's good information. Um, Shondell is asking, will you send out notes on the Mid-Columbia Library's case study? I would like it. I, we might be covering that when we send out um, the the link to the video recording and your presentation. So what what do you think about that? 
Yeah, we are actually putting together a formal case study on that one. So we'd be happy to share that with everybody um, at a later date. But uh, yeah, we will we'll definitely be sharing this presentation out with you. I know it's a lot of voiceover to that, but we can get a little more detail on it as well. Excellent. Yeah. So we'll send that in the sometime, maybe not the most recent follow-up, but, but a follow-up after that. And Claire is asking, okay, this is a great segue. Do you have another case study that is focused on a business? Uh, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that, Claire. So let's <laughs> jump over to our next uh, case study then, um, which is uh, about a company called Energy Northwest. Now, um, Energy Northwest, um, and, and I've, if I say anything wrong, Kelly's going to correct me at the end of this um, case study. But uh, Energy Northwest uh, asked us to do a project for them. They wanted more people on the west side of the state to see the benefits of nuclear energy, but they didn't know the best messaging that would garner the most support and change minds. Uh, they knew that a particular segment of the population would be more likely to change their minds. So we focused our research on that target audience, 25 to 40 year olds. And with that in mind, we started to gather data that would be used to create a marketing campaign for Energy Northwest. Uh, we did our focus groups over Zoom because we were still tail end of COVID and everybody was a little iffy. We felt like that would be the best way to do that. Uh, but we conducted those focus groups on Zoom. We gathered the audience's thoughts on on nuclear energy, wanted to identify their biggest hurdles in their minds when it came to thinking about nuclear energy as a, as a good option. Uh, we then hypothesized a few messages with those individuals to get their feedback in real time. By sharing multiple messages in these focus groups, we were able to understand the why behind their responses. This is the beauty of qualitative research. It helps us to understand more in depth why people believe what they believe and choose what they choose. These focus groups allowed us to hone the right message, the right tone, the right imagery to create an ad campaign that would have the biggest impact with this community. So we tested that refined campaign in a follow-up survey, gathering more than 500 survey responses so that they, we could do a better job in informing the creation of the marketing materials that would get Energy Northwest the biggest bang for their buck. The result has been the creation of a website and marketing materials focused on a story that resonated most with the audience. It has also led to multiple videos and radio spots using the imagery and storytelling that connected most with the audience. This has given an uptick to Energy Northwest website focused on nuclear energy and has moved the needle in more people in the state seeing nuclear energy as a carbon-free solution for our energy needs. Hopefully that was good, Claire. Um, any questions about uh, about the Energy Northwest or any comments from Kelly? Jessica is asking, how did you track to post campaign data? How oh, sorry, just a minute. She's. Do you want to unmute yourself, Jessica, and ask that question? Yeah, sorry, my fingers are fat at the moment. So. Um, you mentioned that post campaign, you saw the needle shift on the West side for uh, their opinions of nuclear uh, energy. Can you explain how you gathered that information or, or where you got that from? Just curious. Sure. So it's just from, it's just from looking at uh, the numbers and, and uh, doing additional surveys afterwards to understand what's, what's happening in the state and, uh, if the if that needle's moving a little bit, so it's just been follow up surveys with the with that population. Wonderful, thanks. Yep. Any other questions about this case study before we jump over to our next slide? I think I'll just add. This is Kelly. Um, I worked with Sunny and Aaron on this project. And um, I think what was the most fascinating for me is that a lot of my data, you know, I've seen just in the past has been like, just through like Facebook comments and people who just want to share their opinions over there and um, getting to listen in on the focus groups and sitting in the background and just hearing real people talk about, you know, their feelings toward a message that, you know, has been your day in and day out for so long and just being like, there's some eye opening um, opportunities that I just found to be invaluable. Um, and to be able to also 
have that data to be able to tell, you know, our senior leaders or, you know, my boss, hey, this is why the focus of these messages are what they are. Um, you know, we have the data that backs that up to say, you know, they want to, you know, these individuals want to hear the facts or they care about the environment or, um, you know, we chose this music because of, you know, the age group. And um, so just having that um, in my back pocket to be able to explain why we did the things we did. Um, and then also to tie that into results um, has been um, really valuable. I'll give it back to you, Aaron. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to jump on to our next slide then. Um, we've given a couple of case studies now about how organizations have used market research to benefit uh, their business. Uh, so you might be asking yourself, what are the other types of challenges and problems that I can use research to help with? So there are lots of ways that research can benefit your organizations. Um, we've listed just a few of them on this slide, but it's worth exploring just a little bit. Uh, if you want new customers, you need to talk to people from outside of your organization to get them to tell you what would make them choose you. Um, building brand awareness and loyalty comes from in-depth research with your own audience. Um, through testing with your audience, you can create a richer story that connects with them on a different level, perhaps. Um, research can also help you stand out from your competitors and make sure that you are filling in the gaps that they're missing. Uh, it can also inform your strategy so you're not disrupted or blindsided when uh, new trends hit, and it can help you answer any type of question that Google can't answer. Uh, a lot of projects that we have are like, our people just say, I wish I knew this. Well, we can go find that out for you by talking to the right people. And last but not least, it can gain you a seat at the table in speaking with executives about changes to be made because you'll be armed with data and not just your own opinions. So quick summary for uh, our presentation. Uh, we just wanted to end with a few things. First, there's always room to know your audience better. The reason for, uh, the, the reason that's always easier to know your audience better is because change is constant. Um, your customer's changing, the environment's changing, the competition is changing. Uh, and any research is better than no research. Even if it's just talking to five people on the street, do some research. Uh, let the data speak for itself. Use it to tell a story to get across both internally and externally to get the support you're looking for. We recommend doing your research early and often. Uh, when you do research at the front end, you save time, money, frustration. When you do it at the back end, it shortens the learning curve for the next time. And research gives you an edge over others. It instills the confidence that you need to make better decisions because they're based on data. So continue to ask questions and wonder why, because when we dig into understanding that why, we have the opportunity to make a bigger impact. Uh, we love quotes, and hopefully this has inspired you to do some research. So we wanted to give you a quick, a quick quote from uh, Walt Disney. So one question is, and this is for Kelly, um, can you describe anything that you maybe had originally thought of in your messaging about nuclear energy that you changed after getting the data, uh, the market research data, and, and what was that? I think one of the things that comes to mind is that, um, you know, I, I mean, as a communications person, I live and breathe in the messaging um, that's either been passed down to me or that our industry uses. Um, and so what, um, simplifying it down to really small, tangible bits of information um, is, is was key. Um, one of the focus groups brought out that, um, you know, people were like, hey, I really liked this little infographic. And this thing about the pellet, you know, the, the type of uh, fuel that's used in a nuclear um, reactor, like, I want to learn more about that. That's interesting. So, um, you know, versus like, you know, using some of the other messaging that, you know, we do, I was just like, okay, well, let's, let's focus on that. Um, and that became the center of one of the, um, the videos we did was just breaking it down to like, hey, this is the power um, that you get from the pellet. Uh, I mean, it's similar messaging than we, what we've had, but it, it was just good to hear and recognize that, hey, this really resonates with this group of people. They want more. Uh, just give me the facts is what um, we walked away from. 
Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, how you, you can surface some things that you would not have thought of otherwise. And like you were saying, Kelly, um, you know, you see a lot of people on social media saying stuff about nuclear power, but those aren't necessarily the, the people that you're trying to reach. Okay. Uh, have, oh, go ahead. Uh, just to kind of add on to Kelly's comment, I think the, mm -hmm. the, the fun part about that project was creating all the different types of personas that we were able to develop from the mm -hmm. interviews and the first focus group to hone in on, you know, very specific personas. Uh, we created about four or five of them, but shared them again and pulled out all the good bits of each persona and kind of understood the other not to better bits <laughs> to create a very honed in message. Um, that was kind of what Kelly is talking about, like concentrating on this first, this second, this third. So creating uh, levels of information that people can digest in a very uh, succinct way. I think that was the, the fun part of that project that we've learned and came out of. So. So Sunny, you mentioned personas. I think a lot of people or some people may not understand how you use those. Can you describe that? Yeah, so a persona is just a description of a group of people. It could be around their accepted consumer behavior, what their per present thoughts are, and what are their key challenges when it comes to getting a message from someone or solving for a problem in their life, and then understanding and providing a solution um, that we've kind of created, uh, for instance, in this particular project, a message, um, and then breaking it down um, for people and say, hey, this is, do you belong in this group? And then people will say yes or no. And then they can say, yes, I don't like this or no, I don't like certain parts of it. So it's just a very collective um, uh, world of what a person is like uh, when it comes to that message or that product or that brand. That is such a valuable tactic. Um, I'm seeing a question here from Jessica. What are your go-to resources for data? What companies do you have accounts with so you can access their data? If, if that's not proprietary. No, 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 that's fine. Um, we, we don't uh, subscribe to a lot of data houses. We know that there are companies individually that do that. And so, you know, they get the Mintel reports and they get those different types of reports that they need. Uh, we're, our projects are typically where we go out and get the research that they don't have otherwise. So we have a lot of individuals. We have a database of individuals, the subject matter experts, we call them, that we'll go out and talk to. And we do a lot of interviews to get really good qualitative data that way. Um, sometimes we don't have the right person, but typically the person that we know does know the right person or we get there in uh, in two or three calls. And, and by doing those interviews and getting a lot of uh, doing our research, that way we get a lot more qualitative and richer data than you would get in a typical report that you would get from Mintel or uh, Dun & Bradstreet or uh, those types of companies. Mm -hmm. uh, the other tool that we do use for all of our survey uh, collection is Qualtrics. Uh, they've got a really rich product that um, uh, has worked with us in doing so many different things with surveys that uh, it makes things really easy for us and easy for the client so that they can uh, do anything they want with a survey and get great uh, outputs from the um, from the reports that come out of it. Yeah, and just kind of going back to the database that we have, it's very um, diverse um, in nature. Uh, we have individuals that are across multiple industries, but they're all interconnected in some way, shape, or form. So we get a lot of rich data by looking at divergent perspectives as well. Um, so uh, one project that we are particularly working on right now is uh, a technology that can um, uh, keep your food cooler for longer. Uh, meaning that it doesn't freeze, but it stays at freezing temperatures. So we're talking across, you know, produce, meat, distribution channels, uh, production, distribu uh, uh, developers, and things like that. So we always try to build like a huge ecosystem so we can understand the whole entirety of what you're trying to learn. 
Um, but we also go deep into certain areas as well, like higher incentive to get to the, the specifics um, that you can't get from a report, so. Yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone, you can see um, Aaron and Sunny's contact information on this slide, which will be part of the uh, video link when we send that out in a few days. Uh, and then one more question, it's the last one that I see, specifically to the Energy Northwest case study, how did Energy Northwest decide on the age bracket? And I assume that means like the ages of people that you pulled in for market research. I can take that one. Um, so prior studies, prior research had indicated that that age group was less favorable uh, to nuclear energy. Um, so we, you know, kind of do the opposite of that of like, okay, well, let's make that our, you know, our target then. If they're the least favorable, um, we also know from some other studies that it's also an age group that's the most influential or um, uh, open to um, changing their opinions based on information that they've been given. If you've got the facts, you know, your perception may change. So uh, that's why we focused in on them. Okay, thank you, Kelly. And Claire is asking for more information about your messaging strategy research. What steps or tactics do you use when a company wants to know what messages are working or not working in the marketplace? So the, the strategy for understanding what messages work and what don't work in the market. So right. a, a survey will get you the that uh, information pretty quick. You know, which of these do you like the most? Which do you like the least? That'll help you to uh, understand which ones you should toss and which ones uh, uh, you should keep. Um, so yeah, the, the, a survey sounds like the best way to go to get the right to understand which message is going to work for you the best. And then... And then turn into that too. If you find through the survey that you're like, oh, if you like this one and this one, it's easy enough to tweak. Um, but also testing those in real time and focus groups as well is very helpful because then you can start to get dialogue um, working with the you know non-users or non-consumers of your your message or current consumers of your message, just to hear what how they describe it to other people. Um, and then you can start to take some of those dialogues and those. Uh, nuggets to craft new messages that are better or more powerful and test that as well. So you can kind of hone in, um, I guess, more directly to solving some of those issues. So there's a, kind of those two tactics that we typically use just depending on, you know, how, how we want to get there. He said, the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. So go out there and do some research whether that's creating your own survey and distributing it, buying a report, or talking to 10 people on the street, do your research. Your audience will thank you. Okay. Well, um, I appreciate everybody's engagement today. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this month's webinar.
so with that, thank you and um have a good rest of your day.